I'm very pleased today to introduce um, Dr. Zachary Markham. He's an associate professor in the Department of Pharmacy, School of Pharmacy at UW. Um, and he's assistant director for the research, um, for re uh, sorry, assistant director for research for the Pline Center for Geriatric Pharmacy Research, Education and Outreach. He conducts clinical research in the areas of pharmacoepidemiology and health services interventions to improve medication use in older adults. And today he's going to talk with us about a really important topic um, called rational prescribing in Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. Welcome, Dr. Markham. Thank you so much, Barb, and thank you for the invitation to present today. I'm really happy to be with you this evening um, talking about this important topic of rational prescribing in ADRD. Before we get started, I wanted to share that I have no potential conflicts of interest for this topic. The objectives for our session today are to first be able to identify high-risk medications in older adults with Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. Second, to describe strategies to reduce medication-related harm in older adults with ADRD. And finally, to be able to suggest resources to colleagues, patients, and caregivers for safe medication use in older adults with ADRD. We'll cover some additional material, but these are the primary objectives. And after each of these sections, I will pause to field any questions or comments that you might have. So please go ahead and add those into the chat as they come to mind. To provide context for today's session as part of the entire series that Barb mentioned, I wanted to briefly review the four Ms and in the context of our talk today, medication is the most important one that I'll be focused on. Um, and so the overall goal is to use age-friendly medications that do not interfere with what matters, mentation or mobility. So try to keep this framework in mind during today's session and we'll revisit it throughout the talk. So the title of this session is Rational Prescribing in ADRD, which next begs the question, what is rational prescribing? And there's not a single definition. If you ask different people, you'll likely get very different responses. But for the purpose of our time together today, I wanted to share a couple definitions that I think are helpful. First, this definition from Maxwell in 2016 states that it's a logical approach that includes making a diagnosis, estimating prognosis, establishing goals of therapy, selecting the most appropriate treatment, and then monitoring the effects of that treatment. And so you can see tied up in that definition are a lot of different components, um, all of which are key when making prescribing decisions. Another way that you might hear people talk about rational prescribing is as appropriate prescribing, but that is not as comprehensive of a concept and there are others that people might use. Taking a step back and thinking about how you could measure the quality of prescribing, I like to think about these three buckets that are shown on the screen. Overuse or unnecessary medication use, which is when there are more medications than are clinically indicated. Second, inappropriate use, which is defined as medication use in which the risk outweighs the benefit, and we'll talk about that. And finally, underuse, which is when an older adult has a health condition for which medications are recommended, but they're not being prescribed that medication. And for the purposes of our time today, we're gonna to focus on numbers one and two. Another key component to today's session, of course, is ADRD. And so let's think about what is unique about prescribing for older adults with ADRD. I've listed a few on the slide here. So just to go through them, um, because ADRD incidence increases with age, on average, people with ADRD have accumulated a variety of different health conditions. And this leads to the presence of multiple chronic conditions. And that makes it complex and challenging to prescribe without causing drug interactions or side effects. In addition, older adults with ADRD often have challenges with the actual management of medication taking, such as filling a pillbox, maybe due to dexterity limitations, picking up prescriptions from the pharmacy, and maintaining an up-to-date medication list. 
In addition, over time, goals of care might have changed from the time that the medication was first started. For example, when it was first started, it could have been more of a curative approach. Um, and then over time, it could lead to more of a symptom management sort of treatment strategy, at which point the once curative medication might no longer be necessary. And there are many other reasons about what um, prescribing for older adults with ADRD is unique for. And so just take us a moment and pause and think, what else is unique about prescribing for older adults with ADRD? I would say that the one that's missing on the slide that I just presented is the role of the caregiver in medication management for the older adult with ADRD. That's a very unique angle and something that needs to be considered in terms of caregiver education, making sure the caregiver understands what medications are supposed to be given, when, why, and how to monitor for side effects. So let's focus in a bit on inappropriate medication use in older adults with ADRD, which again is defined as medications in which the risk outweighs the benefit. One of the most commonly used references for identifying inappropriate medication use in older adults is the American Geriatric Society Beers criteria, which are named after a geriatrician, Mark Beers. And they're updated every few, few years. Um, the most recent version came out in 2019. Um, if any of you were recently at the AGS meeting a couple of weeks ago, you know that they are recently talking about the updates that they're making in 2022. Although they're not final, they will be coming out by the end of this year. So we will have a brand new set of beers criteria by the end of 2022. There are many components to the beers criteria, but the two main components include the list of drugs that should generally be avoided in older adults, which is table two in the manuscript, as well as the drug disease interactions, which are drugs that should be avoided in older adults with certain health conditions, which are summarized in table three in the manuscript. So for today, we're gonna to focus on the drug disease interactions with dementia or cognitive impairment. And these include anticholinergics, benzodiazepines, the Z drugs for insomnia and antipsychotics. So why are these drugs recommended to be avoided in older adults with ADRD? So when we come back to the four M's framework, we can start by focusing in on mobility. And we know that one of the main threats to independence and mobility in older adults is the risk of falling and importantly, the related injuries that could result from a fall. And we know from decades of research that falling is common in older adults with CDC estimates showing that one in four community dwelling older adults falls each year. These rates are um, on average higher in older adults who live in long-term care settings as opposed to the community. Among people who fall, a smaller but sizable proportion will lead to injuries or even death. And with the aging of the US population, the overall numbers of falls and fall injuries is estimated to increase in the coming years, as you can see here by this image on the bottom. In addition, we know from years of observational research that all of those medications previously mentioned in the Beers criteria, uh, drug disease interaction, that all of these increase the risk of falling in older adults, um, especially those with ADRD. Just as an example of, a, of one study that I was involved in, this was a paper led by Laura Hart in which we examined the association between CNS active medication use defined as anticholinergics, antidepressants, antipsychotics, benzos, sedative hypnotics, opioids, and skeletal muscle relaxants. So those were the exposure, and then the outcome was fall-related injury. And we looked at this in a community-dwelling sample of older adults with dementia, who were then matched to older adults without dementia. And we defined medication use as current, recent, past, as compared to no use, which was the reference group. After controlling for a variety of potential 
confounding variables, we found that current use of these CNS active medications was significantly associated with fall related injury in older adults with dementia. And so now coming back to the 4Ms framework, let's focus in a bit on mentation, which of course is a main focus in the setting of ADRD. And for the sake of time, we're gonna to focus today on anticholinergics and benzodiazepines. So let's start with anticholinergics and cognition. And let's first review a little bit of pharmacology and talk about acetylcholine, which is a neurotransmitter released by nerve cells and it sends signals to other cells. And in doing so, it acts like a mail delivery person. Um, the main functions of acetylcholine in the central nervous system are related to cognition, concentration, and memory. And so when someone takes a medication that is anticholinergic, the drug binds to acetylcholine receptors and in turn blocking its activity. So typically that's done for an intended therapeutic effect, but unfortunately it can cause side effects um, of which there are many and one of which is impaired cognition. So you're probably thinking about, okay, well, what are the drugs that are considered anticholinergic? And the top line message is that there are many, there are dozens of them, and drugs vary in their anticholinergic activity. And so I think it's most important to know clinically those that are strongly anticholinergic. And thankfully, the beers criteria have a nice handy table here that's shown on the right side of the slide of drugs that are strong anticholinergic drugs. And so in skimming these, you can see there are drugs included such as diphenhydramine or Benadryl, oxybutynin, and cyclobenzaprine, among many others. So I would say use this as a reference if you're looking for a succinct list of strong anticholinergic drugs. And so on the topic of anticholinergics and mentation, um, I wanted to share a couple articles that are really important for the field. And so this one was published in 2015 on the association between cumulative use of strong anticholinergic drugs and new onset of dementia. This was conducted in a study called the ACT study, which is based out of Seattle. And it was led by my colleague, Shelley Gray. In the ACT study, participants are enrolled without dementia at study entry and then followed up every two years. And this study has been going on since 1994. We use computerized pharmacy refill data to calculate cumulative anticholinergic use using a standardized daily dose approach and looking over a 10 year period of time. So that was the exposure. And then the outcome of dementia and Alzheimer's disease was measured using standard diagnostic criteria. This study found that the most common anticholinergic classes used in this sample were tricyclic antidepressants, first generation antihistamines, and bladder antimuscarinics. And most importantly, they found that cumulative anticholinergic use was associated with a significantly increased risk of dementia. And so as a point of reference, that TSDD there of greater than 1,095, that represents daily use of a strong anticholinergic drug for more than three years. And so putting that into a very specific example, that would be something like olanzapine, 2.5 milligrams every day for more than three years. And following this important paper, a few years later, this study from the UK used their clinical practice research data link, which is a national database, and they looked at patients who had a new diagnosis of dementia and compared their prescription of anticholinergic drugs before that diagnosis with a matched group of people who did not have dementia. So this is called a case control study. And here, um, they found findings that were consistent with the previous study. So they found that anticholinergic use was associated with increased odds of dementia. Given the fact that this was a large national database, they had very longitudinal data, they were able to go back 15 to 20 years, which is pretty impressive. 
So what do patients believe about anticholinergics and brain health? Um, this was a survey study that I led of a sample of members from Kaiser Permanente, Washington. You can see here that the respondents were mostly female between the ages of 51 and 70 and white. And in this survey, we found that only one out of three respondents reported that over-the-counter sleep aids such as Benadryl are very or somewhat harmful to brain health. And the vast majority reported that they did not know. And so this suggests that there's a lot of room here for patient education um, as it relates to anticholinergic use and its effects on the brain. So to summarize, there is consensus in the field that anticholinergics increase the risk of dementia, and it's thought to be in a cumulative and dose-dependent manner. Anticholinergics can worsen cognition in older adults with ADRD, and so they should be avoided if possible. And we also know that patients and caregivers are often unaware of these risks. And so that's really a call for clear and consistent patient education about this. So now let's talk about benzodiazepines. Uh, some of the most commonly prescribed ones are listed here on the slide. And for the purposes of pharmacodynamic activity, we can also lump in the Z drugs for insomnia with the benzodiazepines because they essentially work the same way. Benzos act on the central nervous system by enhancing the effect of a neurotransmitter called GABA. However, they can lead to delayed recall and memory impairment, as well as impairments in a variety of other cognitive domains. Benzodiazepines are also challenging to use because they can lead to significant withdrawal symptoms, some of which are shown on the slide here in this image. So if an older adult is taking a benzo as needed, <clears throat> they could experience some of these effects. And it makes it difficult to stop a benzo once it's started, um, especially in older adults who have been taking them for long periods of time and at higher doses. When we look at the evidence for benzo use and risk of dementia, it's not as clear as that with anticholinergics, but we do know that benzos can worsen short-term cognition in older adults with ADRD. And so the general recommendation is to avoid them if possible. Okay, so now we're gonna shift from talking about potentially inappropriate medication use to overuse or unnecessary use. And in general, the best approach for determining whether an older adult has any overuse or unnecessary use is to match their, medication, their medical conditions with their medication list and ask yourself, are there any medications that have no clear medical condition? And if that's the case, then that is a potential opportunity um, to identify overuse or unnecessary use and to do something about it. So take a moment and think about what is an example of a medication or medication class that is overused in older adults with ADRD. Maybe you've seen this in your practice or you've read about it. I would say some that come to my mind are antipsychotics, <clears throat> sometimes antidepressants. PPIs are overused across the board, including in older adults with ADRD. Um, benzos and anticholinergics are some others. So unfortunately, the drugs we're trying to avoid are oftentimes used. So it's pretty tricky and calls for um, pretty close monitoring. One category that I wanna focus on today that you might not typically think about, but I think is important to keep on our radar, is supplements that are marketed to be good for the brain. And these can be marketed for older adults in general or those who have ADRD. And so if you're like me, you've been sitting at the couch watching TV one evening and up on the TV pops a commercial for Prevagen <clears throat> with claims stating that in clinical trials, it's been shown to improve short-term memory. It's a breakthrough product 
and it has this really cool secret ingredient that was originally discovered in jellyfish. I mean, amazing, right? You Anybody would want to take it. There's another product that I've seen advertised more recently called Nariva. And in looking at the ingredients, the main active ingredient is coffee. So mostly just caffeine. This is a Google search term trend of Prevagen. And you can see here that over time, it's increasing in its uh, interest. And when older adults go online, they are oftentimes faced with opportunities for misinformation. And this is just a good example of that. So you see here this um, foundation of Alzheimer's research prevention and foundation sounds pretty legitimate. Um, however, when you get to reading it, it says that people should be sure to take their vitamins and memory specific nutrients. And then it suggests optimal dosages from an array of vitamins and minerals. And um, it, it's way overstating what the evidence suggests um, in this space. And so <clears throat> it's really important to ask older adults and their caregivers where they're getting their information to try to help um, contextualize and, and correct any misinformation that they might have um, accessed. So along those lines, this was a systematic review that was conducted a few years ago, and the authors summarized 38 different clinical trials that looked at omega-3 fatty acids, soy, ginkgo biloba, B vitamins, vitamin D plus calcium, vitamin C, beta carotene, multivitamins, and other over-the-counter products versus placebo or other supplements. And the take home message here is that the evidence is insufficient to recommend any over the counter supplement for cognitive protection in adults with normal cognition or mild cognitive impairment. And so that's the most updated evidence that we have so far in this space. So I think it's important to keep that in mind. Also, if an older adult has a vitamin deficiency, that is an indication to treat that. Uh, but that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about just in general for cognitive protection. Um, and, and in that space, the evidence is insufficient. The Global Council on Brain Health is an independent collaborative of scientists and healthcare professionals and policy experts from around the world who all are working in this area of brain health. <clears throat> and it convened um, in 2019 to come together to address this topic of dietary supplements for people age 50 and older. And just as a way of background, what are we talking about when we talk about dietary supplements? There are products that are taken by mouth <clears throat> that contain a dietary ingredient, and it can include a wide variety of ingredients such as vitamins, minerals, amino acids, enzymes, and it can come in basically any dosage form that you can imagine. So how many dietary supplement products do you think are sold in the US? It's a pretty staggering number. Um, in 2018, it was 85,000. And it is generating a lot of money, um, which is why there are so many and why you see them advertised everywhere. One important um, thing to keep in mind is that manufacturers are generally prohibited, of course, from selling unsafe ingredients but none regulates or evaluates dietary supplements for their effectiveness before they're allowed to be sold. And so <clears throat> just simply put, the FDA is not in a position to determine whether dietary supplements are both safe and effective. The FDA has the ability to pull something from the market if it's unsafe, but that's very different than their position on prescription drugs, which people have to prove they're safe and effective before they're even marketed. With dietary supplements, that is not the case. <clears throat> In this report, they did a survey of older adults and um, the vast majority of older adults believe that supplements are at least somewhat important for overall health. And a lot of them are taking them on a regular basis. Specifically within supplements, we wanna focus in today on the memory supplements. And this is a growing portion of the overall market. You can see here that sales 
doubled from 2006 to 2015, and I'm sure that this trend has continued. Um, more than a quarter of Americans age 50 and older regularly take supplements for their brain. And in this survey, I think this is pretty shocking. 11% reported that they're currently taking a supplement to delay the onset of dementia. And that's inconsistent with the evidence. And 8% said that they were currently taking a supplement to reverse dementia, which we don't have prescription drugs that can do that. Um, and so that, again, is an opportunity for um, education. And just to jump in a little bit further on the Prevagen, you know, this was <clears throat> the main ingredient, this jellyfish protein. I wanted to highlight what is the evidence behind it. The main clinical trial that used that they used for the claims of benefit did not have a control arm, which is really problematic. And the second trial failed to show improvement. <clears throat> On a pharmacology level, this protein is likely broken down in the gut before reaching the brain. And so just all around, this is not a good product. The message is don't waste your money. Um, there are many other things that we can do that are good for our brain and our heart that do not include taking Prevagen. So this report also came out with consensus statements that I just wanted to walk through because I think these are really good counseling points. For most people, the best way to get your nutrients for your brain health is from a healthy diet. The best evidence comes from the Mediterranean diet. They did not endorse any ingredient, product, or supplement specifically for brain health. Um, but again, the caveat here is unless you have a nutrient deficiency, then that of course should be corrected. A lot of people wonder about fatty fish and omega-3 fatty acids. They say that um, eating fish through your diet is probably good for you, but there's insufficient evidence that a fish oil supplement is good for brain health. So again, let's focus on the diet. They make this important point that supplement manufacturers and distributors often make vague or exaggerated claims. And because of the lack of regulatory oversight, um, consumers, we all should be approaching this with skepticism. And also our skepticism should come from a place of concern about safety because the quality of ingredients can vary widely. Um, sometimes there's things that are in there that should not be in there, different levels of ingredients. Um, it's very unregulated. So that's the first section of today's talk. Um, I'll stop here and pause for any questions or comments that may have come through the chat. I haven't seen any coming through, Zach, so they may be okay. holding them to the end. Okay, I will continue on them. So now let's talk about some strategies for reducing medication-related harm in older adults with ADRD. And before we can do anything, we need to be confident that we're working with an updated medication list. And this starts with a quality medication reconciliation or med rec. And the best way to do this, kind of the old school way, is to have the patient and or caregiver bring in their actual pill bottles and a medication list. Um, or if you have the opportunity to do a home visit, that's the best because you can see how they store them and see if they need any um, counseling on how to get rid of old or expired medications. And to do a medrec, you'll likely need to use a combination of information sources, unfortunately. Um, so it can start with asking the patient, the caregiver, looking in the EHR, um, and know that you can always call the pharmacy to ask for the patient's medication fill history. Um, that's something that <clears throat> is very routinely done and can be helpful. So this goes without saying, but I just want to make this point that the best way to reduce high-risk meds is to not start them in the first place. But I acknowledge that this is not always possible. Sometimes you inherit patients who have been on the meds for years, um, but just wanted to put in this plug that the best way to stop them is to not start them. And the risk-benefit changes with medications as we age. So this is an important communication point that you can use with patients. You know, what once was a safe drug has now become an unsafe drug because 
of different changes in, in your body and the metabolism and things like that. <clears throat> and so we're often left with a scenario in which we've identified a medication or medications that we want to stop or reduce the dose of, um, and that brings us to the concept of deprescribing. And I really like this definition here as a systematic process of identifying and discontinuing or reducing the dose of meds in cases where the existing or potential harms outweigh the existing or potential benefits. This is all within the context of a patient's cares, uh, care goals, current function, life expectancy, values, and preferences. So this is, again, kind of like the rational prescribing definition. There's a lot wrapped up in there. If you're interested in learning more about deprescribing as a topic, there's a really good summary of it in Up to Date. When do we consider deprescribing? We do so when medications have clear harm, so there's the potential or real side effect. <clears throat> if the patient is taking a high risk or inappropriate med, which we've already talked about what those are, in the case when there's uncertain benefits. So oftentimes in patients who have multiple chronic conditions, it's really not clear what the goal is, especially in patients with life-limiting or debilitating illness in palliative care settings, or anytime there's a change in goals of care. We also want to consider deprescribing when we are able to recognize a prescribing cascade, which is not always possible, but something to keep in mind. <clears throat> and a prescribing cascade is when a, one drug is prescribed that leads to a side effect, which is misinterpreted as a new condition, which is then treated with another drug, and it can go on and on. So one good example is a calcium channel blocker, say like amlodipine, being prescribed for high blood pressure, it can lead to edema, which if not identified as a side effect of the amlodipine, could then be treated with furosemide, you know, a loop diuretic, which could then maybe cause a electrolyte abnormality. So that's a classic example of a prescribing cascade. So deprescribing is pretty similar to prescribing, um, but first you wanna know all the drugs the patient's currently taking. You wanna consider the overall risk of drug-induced harm in the patient that's in front of you to decide on how intense of a deprescribing intervention you need to employ. So if a patient's on a lot of you know, five different CNS active meds, that's a scenario when you'd probably wanna um, you know, use a more in intense intervention as opposed to somebody who's just on a PPI that you could deprescribe. You wanna think about each drug's eligibility to be discontinued and then come up with some sort of prioritization because you can't do this all in a single visit. It takes multiple visits. And then implement and monitor your, your plan, um, letting the patient know that at any point you can stop and restart where they were. Um, sometimes that provides a lot of comfort to patients. How do you become a deprescriber? This was a really good review article that laid out three different steps, which I um, will briefly go through. So the first step is to use a model or framework, and you can start with any of these. So you could think about life expectancy or time to benefit of medications. For example, bisphosphonates, you know, typically achieve fracture reduction within 12 months. Um, statins take a couple of years, other drugs take longer. So you could approach a patient with that in mind, which is kind of a broad concept. The next step is to get a little bit more focused on the medications that they're on. So you're zooming in a little bit, you're prioritizing the drugs for deprescribing. And then the third step is the most specific and you, you start somewhere, you pick a drug, pick a tool, use, a, use an algorithm um, and get down to the specific details of what exactly is gonna happen. So. Um, kind of goes from broad down to very specific. There are an increasingly, um, there's an increasingly number of deprescribing resources that are available. This field is rapidly growing. Um, I've included just a few here on this slide um, that show different deprescribing algorithms and guidelines. Um, the U.S. now has a deprescribing research network. <clears throat> which is generating a lot of really helpful resources. 
the best resource that's been around the longest is out of Canada. Their deprescribing network is called Caden, C-A-D-E-N. And if you haven't heard of this website, I would encourage you to check it out. It's easy to remember, uh, deprescribing.org. And there you'll find a variety of different deprescribing algorithms, information pamphlets, there's patient facing materials as well as provider materials. And they're constantly updating their website. This is just a screenshot of one of their deprescribing de algorithms for anti-hyperglycemics. Anti um, so you can see here, they're very visually appealing, easy to follow stepwise. It includes pretty much everything you need to think about, including monitoring um, and it's evidence-based. Now, all that sounds great, but of course you're probably thinking about the barriers that, that come up of which there are many. So some of the barriers could include an unclear patient population. So, you know, <clears throat> who are we talking about of, you know, everybody on antidepressants or just those people who are on antidepressants and have a history of falls in the past year? You know, you have to be clear about who you're trying to target. Oftentimes patients can have psychological connections with the medications. It can really feel a sense of that care is being withdrawn if you do this. Um, and so it, it's important to um, communicate clearly about what's being done, what they can expect, um, and so on. For certain drugs, there is concern about the risk of adverse withdrawal events, most commonly with benzos um, and some other CNS active medications. This takes a lot of time. And of course, time is the most precious resource right now in healthcare. Um, it also can lead to some confusion over who's in charge, who's leading this, um, especially if the patient is seeing multiple specialists. Um, and that can be a, quite a big barrier. And then the lack of evidence, um, it's becoming less of a barrier as the research in this field grows. Um, but for a long time, we didn't have really solid evidence. You know, We have so much that we know about how to start drugs, but we had very little about how do we stop drugs. Um, and so that, that's kind of the overall goal of this field of deprescribing research. One of the earliest deprescribing trials is called the EMPOWER study. And it was done in Canadian community pharmacies where they sent patients who were on benzodiazepines this information pamphlet <clears throat> about the risks of benzos as well as a tapering schedule. Pretty low touch. And you would think, wow, I, you know, benzos are really hard to get off. I'm surprised if they found anything beneficial. Um, well, they did. They found that at six months, 27% stopped the benzo in the intervention group compared to 5% in the control group. So this was some of the earliest evidence that deprescribing of what historically are thought to be pretty hard drugs to come off of can be done. And this was out of Canada. Um, and this group has replicated these results and expanded them um, to other medication classes as well. Another thing you might think about is, well, you know, do patients really wanna do this? Do older adults really want to deprescribe? Um, and in this study, they used a questionnaire called the patient attitudes towards deprescribing. And just I just wanted to highlight this top line. The item was, if my daughter, doctor said it was possible, I'd be willing to stop one or more of my regular medicines. And the vast majority either agreed or strongly agreed. So older adults are interested in this if it's done you know, in the right way um, and they feel like they have a sense of um, buy-in in the process. So I've mentioned this a couple of times, but communication is key for deprescribing. It's important to take advantage of opportune moments and align with the patient's goals. You know, so if the patient really wants to attend a graduation of a um, grandchild, you know, you could frame it in that context of, you know, we, we really want to reduce your risk of falling because if you fall, <clears throat> that could really impair your mobility you know, things like that. So kind of broadening it to the overall context of what matters to the patient. This takes time. And so you might need to prime the pump and mention, hey, you know, at the next visit, I'd like to talk about potentially coming off of the gabapentin. And then at that next visit, you can bring it up again. 
But I also wanted to acknowledge that stopping a PPI like omeprazole is quite different than stopping oxycodone. And these two deprescribing strategies would likely need to be quite different. And so not all deprescribing interventions are created the same. Like I mentioned, this is an active area of research and in clinical practice. And this is one example of an ongoing clinical trial called R2D2 that is being done at Indiana University. And it's testing a pharmacist-based deprescribing intervention for older adults in PCP, um, in the PCP setting. It's enrolling older adults who have subjective cognitive decline but do not have dementia, and they're currently on a strong anticholinergic medication. And cognition is the primary outcome here. So this will be the first trial of its kind, um, and it should be completed within the next couple years. Um, and so this is just one example. There are other trials of deprescribing that are ongoing. Um, and so, you know, within the next five to seven years, we'll know a lot more about what the evidence points to. So some take home points, our goal should be to minimize exposure to CNS active medications in older adults with ADRD to the greatest extent possible. Among older adults receiving CNS active medications, consider dose reduction or discontinuation if deemed appropriate. <clears throat> Stay tuned for trial data on deprescribing anticholinergics and consistent patient and caregiver education is needed on medication risks as we've seen. So before we go to the third section, I'll pause and field any questions. Uh, so there is a question um, asking what about Vyvanse, if I'm pronouncing that right, or Abilify? What about it? Um, so Abilify would be an atypical antipsychotic and so that you know, it's definitely a medication that can be overused in older adults with ADRD due to some of the behavioral disturbances. And it's also associated with increased risk of falls. Um, and so it's a medication that we wanna keep a close eye on. Um, I didn't go into the antipsychotics today just due to time, but yeah, it's definitely um, a high risk medication. Other questions, folks? Um, what about um, high blood pressure medications and dizziness? Oh, that's a great question. So the short answer is it depends. Um, the literature is pretty mixed in terms of high blood, like antihypertensives and the risk of falls. You know, it probably only matters for the, those patients that are prone to orthostasis. Um, and so for most patients, it's not going to be a concern, but in certain patients that might be dehydrated um, or if it causes um, urinary frequency in the middle of the night, that could lead to a fall. So there are definitely scenarios in which a patient is taking an antihypertensive and they could be at increased risk for falls. But um, in general, it's not something that you need to think about um, in this patient who has stable blood pressure control. Okay, I don't see any other questions. Oh, here's Great. one. Um, the person has used Vyvanse for ADHD for several years. Should they stay on it? So Vyvanse, um, yeah, there's really not good literature on the ADHD meds in older adults, um, you know, it's, it's an, a stimulant. So it's the opposite of kind of what we've been talking about, which are CNS depressants. Um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't think um, in terms of fall risk or cognition, um, I wouldn't think that it wouldn't rise to the top of my list. I would want to evaluate it and make sure that it's still working in the way that it was intended to work, but I wouldn't be too concerned about fall risk. Okay, thanks. I think that's it for now. Okay, great. And we'll have time at the end for questions as well. So now we're into the final 
section, which is all about resources for colleagues, patients, caregivers on safe medication use in older adults with ADRD. And so take a moment and think what resources do you use or have you heard of related to medication management in older adults with ADRD? Um, if not, then think about where would I go to look? One that we've already talked about today is the AGS Beers criteria. And with the Beers criteria, <clears throat> the American Ger Geriatric Society has gone to great lengths to create a bunch of resources that accompany it. So there's a mobile app, a pocket reference card, and tools to, to help patients and caregivers in understanding what the terms mean. So if you are an AGS member, you'll have access to this at geriatricscareonline.org. If not, healthandaging.org is a great resource um, that's free and you can access materials such as this. So you see here some tip sheets on 10 medications older adults should avoid or use with caution, avoiding over medication, alternatives for the beers list, the medication and supplement diary. Um, so this is a great, a great place to go yourself and to send your patients. This is a screenshot just to show you an example of what their materials look like. They're quite nicely designed, easy to read, and you can print them on a single piece of paper front and back. In addition, the National Institute on Aging, which is part of the National Institutes of Health, has a center for Alzheimer's and related dementias education and referral. And this was created many years ago by Congress, but the goal is that anybody can call and email and get their questions answered about Alzheimer's disease and related dementias, and they can make referrals. Um, there's Spanish language resources available, and they have um, some other, the NIA also has some other caregiving um, resources that are available. Everyone's probably familiar with the Alzheimer's Association on their website. They have some articles that you could consider reviewing. And one that I wanted to point out because it relates to the herbal supplements for cognition is this resource called Cognitive Vitality. <clears throat> and this is a website that evaluates the evidence on strategies to promote brain health and prevent dementia. And it includes both prescription drugs as well as herbal supplements and vitamins. And I like it because it summarizes everything that we would care about, which is the evidence for effectiveness, potential benefit, as well as safety. So it ranks the strength of the evidence based on these little icons here. And you can read what they mean, but basically this is the greatest strength, so multiple randomized controlled trials down to the weakest strength of no human studies. Potential benefits, so this is probably the most clinically meaningful category. And then safety concerns. If there's four marks here, it's very low risk. And so a lot of times what I've experienced is people have questions about things that I might not have heard about before, um, both from patients as well as from my own family members. Um, and so this is a great resource where you can go and you can look up, like I said, both prescription products like ARBs, as well as herbal supplements that you may not have heard of before. And again, I like it because it's nice and easy um, in terms of visual display. You can see the evidence, um, benefit, and the safety. So I would encourage you to check that out if questions like that come up um, for you. During COVID, which we are still living in a COVID world, um, oftentimes patients with ADRD can have issues navigating the pharmacy. And so this is just a link to check out that gives some tips on how to do that. And one of the key points here is that a lot of pharmacies now offer delivery options. So if the older adult does not want to use a mail order, um, some of the community pharmacies are offering delivery now. And so that can be an option. This is a resource that was created early on in the pandemic as it relates to the post-acute and long-term care setting. 
about how to manage medications <clears throat> during uh, during COVID. And I know we're focused on the primary care setting, um, but just as an FYI, if you or you know of others who are interested um, in that care setting. And so to summarize, CNS active medications can negatively impact mobility, mentation, and what matters in older adults with ADRD. We talked about deprescribing as a systematic approach to reduce the dose or discontinue meds for which the risk outweighs the benefit. And we talked about a few resources that are available to support safe medication use in older adults with ADRD. And so I would charge you to commit to look, looking up or learning about one of these new resources and telling a colleague about it so that we can pay it forward. And with that, I will open it up for questions. This is just excellent, Zach. Thanks so much. I really appreciated the resource. We do have one question at this point. Um, is metaxalone, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, relatively safe as a mu muscle relaxant for occasional use in older adults? Great question. So in general, we try to avoid the skeletal muscle relaxants in older adults um, because they can cause some of those anticholinergic side effects, <clears throat> including falls. So, and, and when you look at the evidence for how we should be using skeletal muscle relaxants, typically it's just for acute short periods of time um, anyways. So the, the overall message is to try to minimize use as much as possible and make sure that there's a stop date if you do decide to use them. Other questions, folks? I have to admit this was really clear, so I don't have a lot, but um, what should be used for older adults with depression? Yeah, so typically, um, this is a tricky question, but the, I mean, typically first line is gonna be an SSRI and we want to try to avoid things like paroxetine because it's highly anticholinergic, even though it's an SSRI. And so typically you'll see medications like sertraline or citalopram. However, if you spend some time in the beers criteria, you'll see that these are medications that can also increase the risk of falls. And so it's quite tricky if you have an older adult who you're concerned about falling or has recently fallen and they have depression, you know, which risk wins out. And so that's a clinical decision. There's not clear guidance from the beers criteria or the literature on what to do. But I would say, you know, in general, you probably want to treat the depression um, and then try to minimize the risk of falls through other interventions. But typically SSRIs are gonna be first line. And would you mind talking a little bit about pain meds for older adults? Yeah, so I have, um, I'm quite frustrated by the pain meds that are available currently on the market because if you go down, you know, acetaminophen is not gonna always work. It's typically you should start with it first for OA, um, but then NSAIDs are risky in older adults due to the wide range of side effects and opioids, you know, we don't wanna use um, if, if we don't have to because of the side effects. So one point is that we need new drugs actually on the market um, that are safe and effective for older adults. <clears throat> but beyond that, it depends on the type of pain. Um, in OA, which is going to be the most common, um, acetaminophen is going to be the first line recommendation in addition to, to weight bearing exercise. Um, and NSAIDs are, are risky, um, even though a lot of older adults take them. Zach, you had mentioned um, the um, um, omega um, supplements, that sort of thing. Um, are there other supplements or um, um, over-the-counter kinds of meds that you frequently see older adults taking that need to be considered in this focus of deprescribing? Yeah, that's a great question. So... I see a lot of ginkgo biloba still used in the context of um, cognition 
specifically. And there, there actually have been clinical trials um, that have shown that it's not helpful um, for preventing cognitive impairment. So that's an easy one. Um, oftentimes you see um, like vitamin D that's kind of hanging around and typically it's not necessary um, based on the patient. As long as the patient's eating a reasonable diet, um, I'm trying to think of what else. Sometimes, you know, you see some pretty random products, and you know, you you want to approach those with. Um, you don't want to just come in and say this is this doesn't work. Where are you taking this? You want to first understand what the patient thinks it's doing for them, and then you know ask the question of you know, would you consider stopping it or, you know, especially in patients who are spending a lot of money on them. And if their income is limited, that that can be a way to kind of frame it. Um, but, you know, you want to come in with um, kind of an open mind and try to understand what they think the product is doing. Um, but those are some of the most common ones, the omega-3s, vitamin D, um, ginkgo, things like that. That's helpful. One of the things I've also noticed is that they might be taking three different um, sort of um, formulations, I guess you could say, of medications. In other words, like three different calcium yeah. that yep. all have sort of different names. And so they think they're different medications. Yeah. <laughs> you see that a lot with vitamin D as well. So it'll be mm -hmm. in the multivitamin that they're taking. Then they're taking vitamin D and they're taking calcium that has vitamin D. Yeah. Yep. Other questions, folks? Well, I really appreciated the clarity with which you presented everything. Um, uh, this was just an excellent um, uh, overview, and um, I'm hoping that um, people will continue to refer back to it for future reference um, thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, thanks um, for having me. Yeah. And if you have any follow-up questions, please feel free to email me. Uh, my email is listed here on the slide. I'd be happy to respond. Great. We're getting a lot of chats about how awesome this was and thanks for the resource list. So everyone, yeah. I will see you next week. That will be the last in our series. Um, the Jerry Health Series will start up again in January of 2023, um, but I will see you next week and looking forward to it. Thanks so much, Dr. Markham. Thank you. Have a good evening.